St. George, the way of the warrior saint, where we unleash greatness by becoming strong Christian men and women. Christ is risen. Caring about what other people think. Caring about what other people think can be a devastating thing to, to most of us, to all of us, really. And all of us at some point in life, we face that temptation, that struggle to, to allow our actions and our behavior and our lives to be dictated by our fear of how other people will perceive us, about how other people will think about us. And sometimes, unfortunately, if we allow our behavior to be dictated by what other people say, we may find ourselves missing the opportunity, the success, the blessings that God offers to us. And sometimes in spite of the consequences of doing right behavior, of taking right action, in spite of how others may perceive us and how others may talk of us, talk about us, can lead us to receive the blessings that God offers. And today, this morning in this beautiful gospel from the chapter from the gospel of John chapter 9, we see those two things juxtaposed for us, given to us, presented to us right there smack in the middle of this deep and rich chapter. You see there was a man. We heard the story just now, chapter 1, sorry, chapter 9, verse 1 through 38. There's a man who was born blind from birth, couldn't see, no sight, no eyes, didn't work, couldn't see, and Jesus comes by and grants to him healing. He restores his sight. He comes to the man bringing the blessings of sight to back to one who could not see. Now the Jews didn't like him. See, the Jews had a problem with Jesus. They didn't like him. They were jealous. They were angry. They thought people are leaving us and going to follow him, and we don't want that. They were very, very strict um, religious fanatics almost, even to say it right. And they had said that anybody who confesses Jesus to be the Christ, to be the Son of God, they would kick him out of the synagogue. Anybody who confessed Christ would be kicked out of the synagogue. That'd be like if our bishop said to any of you, to any of us, you, you believe that, that Jesus is the Son of God? Well, out of the church you go. And not that they would ask us politely to leave, but that they would kick us out. And then even perhaps to hire policemen to stand guard at the door to make sure we don't come in. I mean, it seems kind of absurd for us who know that Jesus is the Son of God, Jesus who is the Christ. And yet this is precisely what the Jews were doing at the time of this healing of this blind man. Because they were jealous and they didn't like him. And so there are two beautiful encounters well, actually, there's one beautiful encounter and one sad encounter in the midst of this story. And the Jews call the man, they call this blind, the man who was formerly blind, and they ask him. He says, Jesus healed him. And they don't believe him. So they called his parents. They called his parents to come and vouch for him. And they said, is this your son? Was he born blind and how does he now see? The parents, so devastatingly afraid, paralyzed, if you will, by the fear of the Jews, the, the ruling religious elite, that they would be cast out of the synagogue because they cared so much about what others thought about them and so afraid of the consequences for speaking truly, they said the following. Yeah, that's our son. We can verify that. We can also verify. You know what? When he was born, he had no sight. But we don't know how, we don't know how he was healed. You know what? He's a big boy. Ask him. He is of age, they said. Ask him. We don't want to deal with it because we don't want to face the consequences. And so they sat paralyzed on the fence, missing the blessings of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, in contrast to that, the blind man himself is called back. And with great boldness, and perhaps even a little snarky, right, he gets right back into the face of the Jews. They said, hey, tell us again. Give God the praise. We know that this Jesus guy is a sinner. Tell us the real story. Right? You can see what they're saying. Like, make sure you tell us the right words so we don't kick you out of the synagogue too. And he, he gets right back in their face. He says, what's the matter with you people? Right? Like, I already told you. This is what he did. He spit in the dirt. He put it in my eyes. He said, go wash. And now I can see. Why do you keep asking me? Do you also want to believe in him? Do you also want to be his followers? You can see how, how ferocious he's becoming as time goes. 
unafraid of what they might do to him, unafraid of the consequences of being cast from the synagogue. And the Jews didn't like it. They said, what? This guy's a sinner. You, I mean, you're going to tell us this guy's a sinner. And he says to them, beautiful, so awesome. Well, I don't know. The Bible tells us that God doesn't listen to sinners. And God listened to this man and healed my eyes. So you do the math. If he doesn't listen to sinners, how could he have done this healing? And they got so irritated, they cast him out. But you can see in the, in the blind man, he is unafraid of the consequences that go with right action. He is unafraid of doing the right thing. He's unafraid of living truly a crucifixional life, knowing the consequences. And perhaps maybe even being you know, uncomfortable with, or maybe even perhaps being a little afraid of what these others might think, because it would cost him his membership in the synagogue. He spoke the truth. He stood strong and he witnessed. He did not find himself lost in, in action, in paralysis, but he moved, he acted, and he spoke valiantly and he spoke the truth. And for all of us, this is a great image about how we, in our own lives, when we find ourselves coming face to face with that fear and that temptation to do not necessarily the right thing because we're worried about what other people will think. And every one of us faces that in our lives. We all face that horrible moment when, even if it's not necessarily conscious, perhaps it's unconscious inside our, our, our bellies, we're like, oh, I don't know if I want to do this. What will he say? What will she say? How will I be perceived? What will they think of me? And so many people, so many of us, find ourselves paralyzed by this fear, by this concern of other people, that we find ourselves sitting on the bench sitting on the fence, sitting outside of the game of life, just watching it happen. And with that, we miss all of the success that we might have in our relationships, in our businesses, in our work, in, our, in, our, in all of life, and ultimately the blessings that come from God when we sit on the fence. And so we come to today's practical point on the way of the warrior saint. How do we do that? How do we, I mean, this is a fear that is common to every man and woman that is, was, and ever shall be. And anyone who, by the way, anyone who ever tells you, I don't care what other people think, they're either lying or they're a fool. Right? It is in us. Like, look, we were, I was talking about this this morning. Let's say it. Practical point number one. Why? Why anyways do we do that? Why do we care so much, so much about what other people think? What's the, the driving force? And really, I think it's connected in our DNA. You see, we need to feel loved, appreciated, affirmed, accepted. We need to feel felt by other people. That's in us, in our very DNA. In the ancient days when we all lived in, you know, like monkeys in the trees type of thing. Anyone who wasn't accepted by the community was cast out of the community. And that would lead to death. You could not live outside the community. And that's in our very core as human beings. God has made us in his image, and his image is trinity, relationship, connection, love. And so we desire that. We crave it. We need that. And so anyone who says to you, I don't care what other people think. I mean, mostly, I hope you don't. I hope that you do right action because you don't really, you're not concerned with what people say. But somewhere inside of us, there is that deep calling, longing, need to feel accepted, affirmed, loved by others. That's why we do it. And to deny that is perhaps to deny your very humanity. So how do we conquer that? And why do people do that? I think the first, the first step, really, like, it's the first thing, let's say this. Why do people do it? Why do people criticize us so that we can come to understand? The first practical point, really, the first step is we have to understand in our minds why they do this. And look, if you're creating and you're offering something to the world and you're giving your very best to the world and someone criticizes that, why would they do that? What would motivate someone to do that? Really, there are only two great motivators, fear and love. And people criticize in fear. People criticize because they say, oh, he's doing what I should be doing. She's doing what I long to do. And because they see in you a creator, someone who is offering your highest, highest contribution to the world, and because they are not, and because they are afraid of what others think, keeping themselves stuck on the fence, 
their natural reaction is to criticize, to offer negativity. You see, that's their offering. People who offer this negativity upon you is because that's the only gift they have to contribute to the world. And that's why people do that. We have made them perhaps ashamed or afraid, whatever it may be, because they are themselves sitting on the fence. So practical point number one, make sure that we always remember the reason why people do that. 99% of the time, the reason why people uh, say the things against us that they say is because they feel ashamed sitting on the fence. Number two, practical point number two. In coming to care less, at least, about what other people say, what other people think, it is to be constantly in motion, to be constantly moving. And let's say this, not constantly in motion, constantly in action. It's interesting, great story. I was watching a YouTube video of a, a, a speech that Will Ferrell gave at USC, commencement, extra, uh, commencement address at USC. And they were, he was talking about how when he joined Saturday Night Live, people criticized him. And he said, I, I didn't really read the criticism. I didn't really listen to the criticism. I never bothered with it. Not because he was necessarily above it, but because he was so busy doing his work, he didn't have time. And if you are going to offer your highest contribution to the world, whatever that may be, you will receive criticism for it. In fact, you should want criticism for it. We'll come to that in a moment. But recognize, recognize that if you stop what you are creating, if you stop the offering that you are making to listen to the criticism, you have done what? You've stopped making your offering to the world. Keep going. Andy Warhol said this. I wasn't going to say it, but I'm going to say it. I hope this is right because I haven't verified this yet, but I heard that Andy Warhol said it and I loved it, so here it comes. It was said that as, as he, he meant, you know, Andy Warhol was a, a, an artist. He said, a painter, he did all kinds, of, you know his work. The, the soup, what is it? Campbell soup cans, that stuff. All right, Andy Warhol said, make your art, create your art and put it out. And while others are deciding whether they like that or don't like that, make more art. His statement was, you don't have time for that stuff. Ain't nobody got time for that. Do your work. Get going. Do your business. Right? And let the others speak about it. The third part, and you, this one's tough, but you got to remember this. As we, we understand why people do it, we continue to work through it, we recognize that it is a great joy and a great blessing to have haters. To have people who are criticizing you. It may say, you may say, yourself, that's crazy. No one wants the criticism. You don't? Why do you not want it? Why do people criticize? We already said it because you're on the right path. I always say it. You've heard me say it too. If you have five critics, go get five more. I always want more haters because it means I'm on the right path. It means I'm doing something to stir the pot, to make people think, to stretch them outside of their comfort zone. And when people get uncomfortable, they criticize. If you have no criticisms, it's because you're probably not doing anything, right? You have to recognize, look, the Son of God who created the whole everything came down and they criticized him and they put him on a cross. And he said to us, what? Don't ever think that the servant is above the master. If they went after me, says Jesus, they're going to go after you. And so if you're stirring the pot the way Christ was calling people into question, you better believe you're going to face criticism. It's scary when you don't have it, as funny as that may sound. Right? I know that everyone's looking at me funny like, what are you talking about? I'm telling you, if you have no critics, it's probably because you are not offering your highest contribution to the world. And lastly, number five, it's the simplest one I'm going to say and perhaps the hardest one to do. Trust in God. Believe it. Believe that his way, that God's way, a crucifixional life is the only way that truly works. By sacrificing ourselves for the sake of other, it's the only way that truly works. And we call that here, we call that crucifixional living, living a crucifixional life. And we have to trust in God that it works. We hear in the book of Proverbs, chapter 29, verse 25, we hear the following, that he who puts his trust or he who fears in man is going to find himself in big trouble. But he who trusts in the Lord shall be safe. 
If you're worried about men, you're going to find yourself in trouble. But if you trust in the Lord, you will find that safety. And I promise you this. Here we end and wrap all of it up. As the blind man who was unafraid to do the right thing, in spite of the consequences that he knew were coming, he confessed his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and as a result, received the blessing of sight and the great gift to worship him, to follow him, ultimately unto his salvation. And that's put forward for all of us as well. If we spend our lives worrying about what other people think, we will find ourselves paralyzed, perpetually in a state of paralysis, sitting on the fence, not involved in offering our highest contribution to the world. And Christ our God has said, let those thoughts go by. Don't worry about that kind of stuff. Trust in the Lord and you shall find that safety, that blessing, and in the end of our days, God willing, that salvation and eternal life. May our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who heals the blind man, gives sight to those who can't see, restoring and healing all of us in our sickness. Bless and keep you. Amen. Hey, hey, Warrior Saints. Thank you so much for watching. To learn more about the Warrior Saints movement, visit us at warriorsaints.org. And until I see you there, keep walking on the way of the Warrior Saint.